Shri Sai Ram. My loving pranams at the lotus feet of Bhagwan Shri Satya Sai Baba, who for me is everything, including my Divine Mother, the composite incarnation of Ichha Shakti, Kriya Shakti, and Jnana Shakti. Sai Ram, and welcome to my sisters and brothers who are joining us this evening. It is my pleasure and honor to speak about my first exposure to Navratri in Prashantinilayam. I was an impressionable teenager. The year was 1980. And that is when I was admitted into the Anandpur campus of the Sri Satisai College for Women at that time, and a year later, the Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Learning. I just want to give you a little background. We joined college a little late, around July, August. And the first big festival that we witnessed was Navratri and Dasira. Now, coming as I am from a place called Srinagar, where Sri refers to Goddess Lakshmi, in the valley named after Sage Kashyap or Kashmir, I come from a land which was the land of goddess, is the land of goddess Sharada, the Sharada Mahapitam, is located just 10 kilometers off the line of actual control in the Neelam Valley across the border. And as a child who grew up in Srinagar, I remember throughout my childhood on every Ashtami, which is Durga Ashtami is supposed to be the birthday of Goddess Durga. So every month, Kashmiri Pandits observe the Ashtami as her birthday. And as a family, we would fast and also visit the historic and famous temple called the Kheer Bhavani Temple outside Srinagar. In that temple as a little girl, I don't know how many times I have prayed for, I have no idea what. I guess a closeness to God. I might have prayed for good marks and stuff like that, but generally to develop love for God and to get to God, get to know the goddess better. And I remember once my family performed a big yagna in that temple and we stayed overnight. And at that time, I was quite young, maybe eight, nine years old. I was mopping the pathway around the temple. That was my seva. I was, I guess, in my DNA, I had seva dal. So I started rather early and I started mopping the temple floor like anything that is the white marble that devotees would walk to circumambulate around the natural spring, the spring of natural water in the middle of which the Kheer Bhavani temple is located. Fast forward to being uh, an impressionable teenager, a fresher in Bhagwan's college. And the first festival I see is a Vedic extravaganza in the Purna Chandra Auditorium. I had never seen anything quite like it. The absolute adherence to Vedic grammar, the purity and sincerity and the discipline with which Navratri was celebrated here was mind-boggling for my little self. And the kind of sounds we were exposed to, I had never heard that kind of Vedic chanting before, nor the kind of bhajans. All of a sudden, our ears met with Veda chanting, bhajans, conjas playing, nadaswaram, instruments, and this resplendent fire in the presence of the Veda Purusha himself. Every time Bhagwan appeared on the stage, it was like we were in heaven. There was very, it was very hard to comprehend and absorb it all. It was just glorious. All I could think as a little girl, as a young lady, was that this is what heaven must look like. This is what it must be like with the Gandharvas playing, you know, whatever I had read in an Amar Chitra Katha, and the Lord sitting there and receiving all the prayers. There were many uh, differences in the Navratri of that time and now, and I will come to them. But the one point I want to make is that had I not experienced the living form of God and looked into the eyes of the goddess herself in the form of Bhagwan Sri Sati Sai Baba, my faith in God would never have been as strong as it is today because I would never have a proof of concept of all the prayers I chanted in the Khir Bhavani temple, of all the pradakshinas I did, 
were they for real or was i imagining was there a stone there that was listening to me all of a sudden in that purnachandra auditorium when the fire lit up and the vedic prayers came on i knew somebody had heard me and someone was responding to all my prayers with intensity now the navratri of those days it was the same purnachandra auditorium it was the same uh, vedic pandits who came but there were some major differences for example in 198 from 1980 to 1986 possibly barring one year i have attended all navratris as a student here but at that time all of us did not know vedam the way everyone knows now most of the chantings were delivered or rendered by the vedic pandits that bhagwan had invited we didn't have the general crowd and the cute little voices of the small primary school children and ishwaramba school children chiming in at that time the second thing is bhagwan's residence was in the mandir in prashantinilayam and the entire darshan ground was filled with golden sands there was no kulvant hall there was no yajur mandir neither of the two buildings block a and b of yajur mandir so bhagwan would come from the veranda of the mandir walk across the sands cross into what is now the yajur mandir compound which was also filled with golden sands and enter the purnachandra auditorium and appear on the stage now there was a huge bonus in this because the pc auditorium used to be packed with people but all the other devotees could also sit in the darshan ground because when bhagwan emerged from the interview room they could have darshan and as bhagwan walked towards the yajur mandir what is now known as the yajur mandir compound there was a lineup of devotees on either sides of his path there would be a beautiful floral rangoli across the entire stretch for bhagwan's path and on either sides devotees would be lined up and at the most we'd have two lines so if you were if i was on a duty somewhere in the canteen and i couldn't get find my way into the purnachandra i had a great chance i could run around and find myself a spot along bhagwan's path and have a very good close darshan and when we came when bhagwan came into that auditorium the atmosphere just became electric i don't know what happened the same prayers became so much more meaningful the same music was touching your heart even more intensely and i think that was my first introduction to the glory of navratri in prashanti and i think i'm sure all over the world people celebrate navratri with so much of love and piety but there's none that can match the fervor the vibration the power of prashanti navratri i say this with so much of confidence because bhagwan built this tradition based on a vow he had taken much early in dharmashetra swami had declared in i think 1968 that his the major cardinal principles of his mission were to protect his devotee protect the vedas and preserve them and expand them isn't it and dharma rakshana veda poshana so we knew that swami is going to build this the way he wants it to save this world and brick by brick and by that i mean literally also each brick on that yagna kunda was placed the way bhagwan guided the most astute and learn- learned vedic pandits to do it every angle every material no compromise no processed and synthetic stuff all organic pure as per as i said the dictums of the vedas and the interest bhagwan took in it and the pen ultimate moment when they would offer the purna ahuti oh the glory of that moment when that little low throne of bhagwan was brought out <gasps> there would be this hush and excitement in the purna chandra and swami sat so daintily and so delicately like a goddess accepting all the prayers and all the offerings and those thunderous speeches he delivered the divine discourses oh my god as a young indian who wanted to see my country progress and make great strides it was so empowering it was so inspiring all we wanted was to be in his seva and his service 
And I must mention one thing. The Navratri in Prashanti in the 80s, as it is today, was so empowering and energizing, but we were much younger. And we had a dormitory, which is, uh, which is where the Shanti Bhavan and the Ladu stall is now located. The key chain on that uh, dormitory key said cement hall. So you decide the nature of that dormitory. But we hardly stayed there. We went there for about two hours out of every 24 to take a shower and wash our clothes and get ready and brush our teeth. That's it. At night, we went to the canteen, sang bhajans and made ladus. All the black uh, granite counters, the tabletops, lined precisely like, uh, like how people walk in the Republic Day Parade, precision. We had precision, five across, 12 down, 60 ladus per table. And we just rolled ladus after ladus after ladus. And then we took a shower, 4 a.m. We were on duty at Purnachandra Auditorium. The lady who was in charge at that time of the crowd control at Purnachandra Auditorium was a strict disciplinarian because she had to control thousands, throngs consisting of thousands of people. If my memory serves me right, her name was Mrs. Nakul Sain, and we all behaved like army, army cadets in her presence. She would divide us into different columns and say, you're in charge here, make sure nobody crosses. This is for teachers, this is for lecturers, this is for VIP ladies, this is for people from the hospital, and so on, and we tried our very best. And uh, we have, uh, I have one very fond memory as a family. One time, Swami, on the last day, there were these buckets of ladus, you know, all the ladus we were rolling for seven days. Those, all those ladus came together and Bhagwan was distributing to some of the famous uh, people in the sitting in the front. So some students were called out to carry those buckets. So both my sisters, Kavita and Kalpana, who were also students, they got a chance to carry those uh, baskets or those buckets of ladus. And then, you know, in the chaos and the excitement and the music, all the elders were saying, move out, move out, sit down, stand. They didn't know, stand, sit, go, run, what? In the meanwhile, in that chaos, Swami just turned to my sisters and he threw a ladu at each one of them. And then everything became just perfect. That was such a precious moment for us as a family. There's one particular incident I'd like to share, which I heard from my seniors. One Navratri, I was told, Bhagwan was sitting, I hope it was Navratri, not his birthday. Bhagwan was sitting uh, on the stage and the legendary M.S. Subalakshmi sang a beautiful Krishna bhajan, Kurai Undrum Ilai. It's a song to Krishna and she sang it right from here. And she sang it with so much emotion and love. Swami was ecstatic and blissed out. And when she finished, he gently opened his eyes and said, once more, just once more. Can you imagine getting a request to sing a song one more time for God? The glory of that Navratri is impossible to capture in words. But the joy of being a part of it is even harder to describe because I can't remember ever feeling fatigued. Can you imagine now going through seven nights of no sleep and working almost 22 hours a day? The remaining two you only use for your personal work like shower and so on. At night, canteen, 4 a.m., report to duty after everyone leaves because the yagna used to go on a little longer at that time. Straight for lunch, go back, shower, come back for duty to PC Auditorium for the afternoon session. Finish late, go back, have dinner, head straight to canteen to make more ladus. Swami kept us busy. And I think that discipline has really stood by us later in life. The ability to multitask and take on a lot of stressful uh, situations and remain relatively together comes from that rigor of being a Satisai student. And I think that just the culture that Swami created, and we were busy doing what? Worshipping God, loving God, practicing His teachings of Seva, adoring Him, singing His glory, listening to His glory. Life couldn't get better. I don't know what else could a person do. 
um, I mean, just partying and hanging out with friends is really very pale and blah in comparison for me to what the opportunities that Bhagwan gave us. And the joy. If Swami just looked at us once while giving darshan, and he really did. He was so generous. Swami looked at us, took our letters, took our poems, looked at, blessed us, gave Padnamaska. Because Bhagwan used to come down the steps of the Purnachandra stage, walk all the way to the back of the auditorium, mingle through and come back. And I have to say, nowhere in the world can such a thing happen without any indiscipline only in Prashantinilayam. Swami went all the way back. And when the penultimate joy after the Purnahuti, the sprinkling of the holy water with that special grass, it was like we wanted to crane our necks into Swami's view so that we would get drenched in the holy water and get blessed. And when you walked back from that auditorium, we were flying, we were hardly able to walk. We experienced such lightness, happiness, fulfillment, deep satisfaction and joy, bliss, 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 nothing else. Navratri in Prashanti was a glorious festival. But if you expect me to say that I feel very nostalgic about it and I miss those days, actually, yes and no. Because I think a place where such Navratri has been celebrated for decades. I'm here talking to you 43 years later. And now that I live in, I'm so fortunate and blessed to live in Prashanti Nilayam. Last 14 years, I have attended the Navratri here. And each Navratri has the same magic that it had when Bhagwan was moving around us. The only difference is, yes, when that little throne comes out on the day of the Purnahuti, my heart tugs and how I wish Bhagwan would just part the curtains and walk in. As much as I feel sad at that one moment, the intensity of his presence that I feel in every cell of my being, it cannot be dismissed. At that time, Bhagwan was the physical form that we wanted to attract attention from. Today, Bhagwan is our heartbeat. He's our pulse. He's the air in every inhalation and exhalation. This morning, when the yagna began and that smoke arose, the experience of being surrounded by God knows how many millions of devas and devis presided over by Bhagwan was unmissable. Can't describe it, can't state. The mind was still, the heart was calm, the senses took a break. And all that I could experience was the presence of the goddess. The goddess I worshipped as a child in Kheer Bhavani. The goddess whose floors I mopped, asking her to befriend me and bless me. What a validation for me it is personally. But I have to mention, being who I am, the daughter of Bhagwan Sri Sathya Sai Baba, Navratri is essentially Swami's reminder to us to cultivate and nurture our feminine selves, the feminine energy in each one of us. Every person, man, woman, child, we are a mix of Shiv and Shakti. And somewhere, the way the world has gone with all the revolutions, the industrial revolution, the growth of AI, we seem to sometimes be missing the Shakti aspect of our own nature and not paying adequate attention to it. I do believe Navratri is a perfect occasion to go back and focus on the kindness, the compassion, the nurturing that the goddess represents, the learning, the willpower, the action-orientedness. You know what they say, if you want to get a job done, give it to a very busy woman. She will do it along with the hundred other things she's doing, and she'll do it with attention to detail, meticulously, because multitasking comes to the goddess. That is why she's represented with so many arms, so many heads. She's thinking five thoughts at once, executing eight tasks at once, and she is not bewildered. She's capable of many moods. She's capable of being fierce when it needs to be, gentle and kind and nurturing when it is required. She's capable of logical, analytical, intuitive, any kind of thinking. Today, on every Navratri, it is our duty 
to go back within and nurture our Devi cells and try to seek Devi in everyone around. I often try to practice it. It's not like I'm there and I see God or the goddess in every woman I come across, but I try to practice it consciously to make it a habit. As Swami students, we were exposed to Swami's uh, Devi Rupa or, or his um, ability to connect with us as our mother many, many times. You know, we had a lot of rigor and discipline in Anantpur because Bhagwan had put it in place. But every now and then when things got a little too hot, Bhagwan himself would intercede and guide us with gentleness. It's okay, you can take a break. For example, one time Bhagwan was giving an interview to a bunch of our sisters and one girl who had severe asthma had started to cough. Now when Bhagwan is speaking in that holy little room, how dare you cough and you know make a big noise? So she was trying very hard to suppress her cough, but she needed to have a drink of water. So Bhagwan was so kind, he offered his glass of water and said, have some water. She looked around at the elders thinking she'll be in big trouble, but nobody stopped her. So she took the glass of water and because her throat was parched, she drank it from a distance because it was Swami's tumbler because she was so reverential. Swami said, no, no, drink, it's okay. I'm your mother, drink it the regular way. And when Swami said, who dared to stop her from drinking? Little touches like that. We kept putting Swami on a pedestal. Swami's our God. Swami kept reminding us he's our mother. And there were so many times when Swami spoke to us in a very light and fun way to convey very profound and serious messages. And in one of the interviews in the prayer hall, what is now our prayer hall, where there is that Krishna and Arjuna at the back, Swami stood by Krishna and Arjuna and he uh, spoke to us about the need to never underestimate ourselves. You know, society may tell us our peers, our families, our upbringing may put us in certain brackets. Swami never did. He empowered us, but in a different way, not in a militant way. Swami's, my understanding of Bhagwan's version of feminism is one that emerges from your confidence in yourself as a divine being. So that atmic feminism is what Bhagwan taught us. And one day he told us this, I have often repeated this story, this light uh, um, anecdote about the army general who had terrorized his entire regiment, was uh, scared of him. The enemy across the border was scared of him. But when the same general with the big mustache and the starched uniform and those polished boots came home, he the first thing he did, he would assess his wife's mood. And God forbid, if she wasn't in a good mood, the general would now start to get nervous and unnerved. And he would wonder, oh my God, what did I forget? Did I forget her birthday? Is it, my, is it our anniversary today? So all this kind of jokes that Swami told us all the time. And he said, don't underestimate your power, but don't misuse it. And one of the, um, one of the Devi Tattvas that Swami always insisted upon was to dress with grace, dress to celebrate your femininity without being outrageous. He said dress to promote humility, not vanity. So in an age where media tells us what is right, what is wrong, what is in, what is out, what will look cool, there is a golden mean that Bhagwan has laid out. We are all free to celebrate our divinity, our femininity, within the boundaries of good taste and humility. This is something, I guess, at my age, it is very easy to imbibe, but for younger people to, draw, to come to their own uh, dress sense and its boundaries is something that has to come from within. And it will only come when we recognize the fact that we are not just anybody walking on the street. We are daughters of Bhagwan Sri Satisai Baba. We are goddesses. How would a goddess dress? What thoughts would a goddess have? What actions would a goddess perform? Would she use language which is very irreverent? I think not. So it, the, current, the current crisis in our society as women stems from a lack of self-confidence. And that self-confidence is not going to necessarily come from self-help books. 
It is going to come from following the teachings of our Mother Sai, who taught us that verily all of us are goddesses. If we chant the Gayatri Mantra, we unleash the power within us, the divine powers, to live a life of Durga, Lakshmi and Saraswati. Every woman in a house brings this abundance of knowledge, common sense and willpower. Look at a family when the mother is not there. Everybody's lost. The moment a mother walks into through the door, even after darshan, okay, we're all having breakfast. This is this one is doing this. She is the multitasking manager who brings order in chaos. And that's what the Divine Mother does. And that's what all of us must remember on this beautiful Navratri day, that we have a role to play. Navratri is a reminder. Never, ever forget that. For me, Bhagwan is the greatest feminist on earth. He democratized access to the deepest knowledge. Very beautiful knowledge that was held within select groups. For example, Gayatri Mantra, the mother of all mantras, was restricted to brahmacharis and brahmins who went through Yagnopavitam. And what did Bhagwan do? I remember again in early 1980s, if my guess is right, this was around 1982. Bhagwan performed a mass uh, Yagnopavitam in the Purnachandra Auditorium, and he initiated all the young uh, men who were getting in, who were having the Yagnopavitam performed. But he asked all of us to chant Gayatri, and he said, uh, "You know what? Ga who is Gayatri Mata? She herself is a feminine form." Everyone should chant Gayatri. There are no restrictions of gender, caste, color, country, nothing. He removed all barriers. And then Bhagwan went on to say the power of the Gayatri is so potent. And But some of you may hide behind the excuse, I don't have time. If that is your excuse, Bhagwan said you have time for a shower. While bathing, if you chant Gayatri Mantra, it becomes Abhishekam. You, this is the temple of God, and within this temple is a divine Atma. When you pour the water and chant Gayatri, you're performing a beautiful religious ritual, spiritual ritual, if I stand corrected. Again, Vedas, I told you, when I was a student, Vedam was chanted by all these pundits who came from major Vedapath shalas in Rajamandri and interior Andhra Pradesh. And Swami Karunyananda ji used to be there. He was leading that whole procession of many people wearing ochre robes. Bhagwan threw the Vedas open to all of us, democratized it completely, universal access, like the world. He, he actually is the World Wide Web, right? He took the Vedam from the hands of a limited few and unleashed it on whole of humanity. That is why in Prashanti Nilayam, you can see Japanese people, men, women, boys, girls, European, Croatians, everybody chanting Vedam. I think that is something that is associated with Navratri, and that is why now, when you sit in that Purnachandra auditorium and Vedam begins, you can hear the Vedam coming from the Vedic Pandits, from the Veda group amongst the student body, from the entire general population consisting of multiple nationalities, both genders, and my personal favorite, the cute little voices of our school children who chant at a different pitch. It is so cute when to hear a mix of so many strains, but same words, same power. And then there's the conch, there is the nadaswaram, there is the bhajan going on, and the sights and the sounds to behold. Again, we feel we are surrounded by Gandharvas, by angels, and the Veda Purusha himself is pulsating through that entire beautiful gathering, and the vibrations emanating from Prashantanilyam are expanding and expanding. So many scientific experiments have been done to prove that the energy coming from inside the ashram, it has a huge radius. It keeps expanding. And for decades, Bhagwan has promoted it. And I feel so honored to witness that even today, there is not a 1% deviation from anything. Everything is as Bhagwan started. It is further improved, more glorious, grander, richer, because more voices and more people are chanting together. So if anything, my favorite line, as always, Prashanti Nilayam is, was, is, and will remain the spiritual capital of the universe. 
So before I let you go, let me share with all of you one of my often repeated and favorite narrations about a warrior princess whose victory we are supposed to be celebrating every Navratri. She obviously goes by many names depending on her mood and the operations she is involved in. Today, let's just call her Shakti. So lately, Shakti has been a busy girl. And like most self-aware women, Shakti has been busy doing what women do best, fighting for the causes we believe in, not through an online petition or a war of words on X, formerly known as Twitter, but through an intense battle involving all the elements within and around at multiple levels. Here's Shakti's work log from Navratri. For nine nights, the goddess fought, and she fought with valor, smarts, and strategy. She had a game plan with specific and measured outcomes to achieve. One demon to vanquish every night. That was her personal goal. And she prioritized using her infinite wisdom. On the first night, she quelled Guess who? Kama, the demon of lust. On the second, she decided it was time to extinguish Krodha, the demon of anger. Then on the third, she dispelled the demon of attraction or moha. She then shattered Lobha, the demon of greed. On the fifth night, she came face to face with the demon Mada and vanquished pride. Hers was an exhausting task, undaunted and undefeated. With an iron resolve to exorcise all her demons, she continued on her mission to vanquish many more. On the sixth night, she confronted the swirling enemy named jealousy and reduced it to nothingness. Then still smiling with the energy of inner beauty, she went forward and smote the ugliness of Swarth, the demon of selfishness. On the eighth night, she terminated anyai or injustice. On the ninth night, using only her kindness, Shakti banished Amanvrata, the dreadful demon of cruelty. Then, on the morning after the ninth night, finally she was about to rest when she realized that her most difficult foe was still upon her. You know what they say about a woman's job is never done. So what exactly did she do? Well, she simply sat in the lotus position, laid down all her weapons, and with a gentle smile and a big sigh, she dissolved her final demon, Ahankara, her ego. Phew! This Navratri, let us all remind ourselves that every woman in our lives is an incarnation of Shakti, starting with ourselves. As women, we need to draw our strength from that knowing. And as men, we need to recognize this strength for our own good and for the good of society. Thank you and side arm.